Thank you, Peter and Chris. Um, you know, um, Peter just instructed us on how scripture is always open to revision. Um, well, so are conference papers, as it turns out. Um, and when, when I was asked for the title of my conference paper a couple of months ago, I submitted something that I thought was general enough that it could work um, for the unwritten, unwritten, as yet unwritten paper. Um, and I've changed my direction a little bit. So if you listen and you think, how does this match up to, to the title in the, in the program, it doesn't. <laughs> Uh, in 2004, Dr. Vincent Wimbush convened the inaugural meeting of the Institute for Signifying Scripture here at Claremont Graduate University under the heading Theorizing Scripture. A 2008 volume of the same title, a book series, Signifying on Scripture, and a graduate program here at CGU in Critical Comparative Scripture all followed under Wimbush's leadership. This intellectual program aimed to radically expand and diversify the way that the term scripture is understood, redefining the phenomenon away from written texts, recentering its semantic weight away from the Bible, excuse me, recentering its semantic weight away from the Bible and reformulating its academic study away from exegesis. He called for a new project that participated in what he called excavation not exegesis, that investigated textures, not texts, and that attended critically to receptions, not conceptions or origins. Those first two formula are, are Wimbush's, um, and the last one, much less felicitous, uh, receptions, not conceptions, is, is my summary of his project. Wimbush's field opening project follows the work of Cantwell Smith, whose 1993 book, What is Scripture, laid its foundation. Smith recognized the vast variety in the form, development, meaning, interpretation, and social functions of what was at the time called world scripture. And he developed a new category that could accommodate this variety. He coined the term scripturalization, which captured the insight that a text cannot originate as scripture in itself. Rather, it is scripturalized, or it gains the status of scripture in the course of its reception through social activities that sacralize, form communities around, and construct ultimate meanings in relation to the text. This ongoing dialogic process is what constitutes the character of scripture qua scripture. Wimbush, interpreting Smith, articulates the insight this way. Scriptures are not the same as texts. The latter are inert without a group agreeing, and then necessarily forgetting that they have agreed, to make of texts or other objects the site for the negotiation of things that matter. So scriptures are made real and compelling only in relationships to objects or persons. It's a Wimbush. Scripture then is better understood as a social process than as an object or a set of meanings, and the locus of scripture is better understood as hovering between the reader and the text than hidden within the text itself. In positing scripturalization as a reader-centered phenomenon, Smith nevertheless maintained that the text has a kind of agency of its own that actively reciprocates the reader's address. Scripture is a bilateral term, he observed. Notwithstanding his redefinition of scripture as a human activity, he continued to see it as a relation between a people and a text. If scripture is indeed a relationship and not a one-way projection, the text must be understood to be as decisive a contributor to the phenomenon of scripture as the human interpretive practices that meet it. In this capacity to act reciprocally on a community of readers, to perform identity, inform ethics, transform existence, or act in other ways, the texts that successfully give rise to scripture differ from other kinds of texts that merely participate in scripturalization, such as commentaries. So Wimbush then departs from Smith's foundation in several ways. In emphasizing textures over texts, Wimbush greatly expands the repertoire of artifacts that may become the objects of scripturalization, including oral, aural, performance, and objects such as stones, wampum, or masks. He thereby offers a definition of scripture that speaks to a much wider comparative range of human experience. In emphasizing reception over conception, Wimbush frames scripturalization as a purely social process in which the community acts unilaterally on a passive, 
if resonant object to produce the scriptural phenomenon, but the object or text performs no reciprocal activity. Aside from its elevation to sacred status, the inert object of scripturalization possesses no privilege difference from any other object, and the particulars of its origin and its semantic meaning are irrelevant. Finally, in, in, in emphasizing critical excavation over exegesis, Wimbush foregrounds power relations and the knowledge power nexus. He recognizes scripturalizing practices as a vehicle by which elites produce discourse that in turn reconsolidates existing authoritative roles. Early American biblical commentaries legitimizing slavery being a prime example. The transdisciplinary, comparative, critical study of scripture should thus be a kind of Foucauldian genealogy of power, for which Wimbush has coined the term scripturalectics. So I was invited to speak on this question, what is scripture? Echoing Smith's title, and I'm game to attempt an answer in Wimbushian terms, in honor of his history here at this institution, and in recognition of the analytical power of his social process thesis on scripture. In my primary work, I read scripture with the critical tools of literary theory and the disciplinary assumptions of theology, which locate the ultimate meanings of scripture not at the horizon of history, as in religious studies, but at the levels of form and performance, respectively. And by that I mean linguistic performance, not um, theatrical performance. Megan will be talking more about theatrical performance this afternoon. Today, I'll attempt an interdisciplinary offering beginning in the mode of the scripturalization thesis with some provisional answers to our question that have recently emerged in Book of Mormon studies. But then I'll offer a mild provocation to Wimbush's project, namely that exegesis of the content or semantic meaning of scripture need not be antithetical to the theoretically sophisticated work of excavation for which Wimbush calls. So Wimbush has noted that the circumstances of the Book of Mormon's production and its history of scripturalization provide a recent and well-documented window into the real-time emergence of scripture from a particular uh, social textual nexus. Wimbush argues that it is precisely Mormonism's relatively belated beginnings in the hyper-scriptural belated formation that is the United States that makes it both somewhat vulnerable to and compelling as a focus of critical attention. Because of the hostility provoked by the Book of Mormon and the religious community that coalesced around it, quote, Mormonism did not for, long, for a long period enjoy the opportunity of relaxed, unself-reflexivity around scriptural formation that center-established religions enjoyed. Early Latter-day Saints and their practices thus said the quiet part out loud about scripturalization, while mainstream denominations escaped such scrutiny for a time thanks to the naturalized authoritative status of the Bible. In many ways, then, the Book of Mormon is the preeminent example of larger processes of scripturalization unfolding in early American Bible culture. So in that spirit, I'll offer three brief comments that I've synthesized from other people's recent Book of Mormon scholarship um, on each of Wimbush's three headings. So first, textures, not texts. The last 10 years have seen a wealth of research on the material production of the Book of Mormon, including Joseph Smith's use of seer stones, the materialization of the gold plates, even the provenance of the leather pouch in which the stone was kept, and the paper and string from which the manuscripts were created. This research highlights important historical particulars, including the communal material processes by which men and women saturated ordinary materials with spiritual meaning. Because this scholarly research is sometimes addressed to, and often read by, Anglophone Latter-day Saints, it should also be understood as part of the ongoing process of scripturalization of the Book of Mormon in the present. This body of scholarship functions to make the Book of Mormon relevant and acceptable to modern readers by, for instance, introducing the contributions of women into what was formerly an intensely male-dominated historical narrative or by re-familiarizing supernatural objects like seer stones in order to make them legible to modern readers, that is, to educated Western modern readers. The future of the church appears to be Congolese, so much remains to be seen about how this stage of scripturalization will proceed. But we can draw from that um, the insight that scripturalization in the present involves not only processes of supernatural or authoritative saturation, but also of desaturation and refamiliarization. 
Second, reception, not conception. The Book of Mormon's reception has been a matter of interest from the moment Oliver's quill captured Joseph's spoken words through which Nephite prophets reflect on the future reception of their labor in 19th century America. Foundational scholarship on Book of Mormon reception began in earnest in the 1980s and has recently been subject to important updating. In particular, Seth Perry's examination of the Book of Mormon in early America's exuberant Bible culture has explicitly taken up the question of scripturalization, arguing that the Book of Mormon and its readers enlist the authority of the Bible in establishing claim to new extra-canonical scripture. So emergent scripturalization processes are especially potent when they redeploy the linguistic and cultural authority of established sites of scripture. But this redeployment must simultaneously reinforce and destabilize these established sites in order to create space for the new scripture to emerge. At the other end of the spectrum, Janice Johnson has recently produced a fine-grained study of the micro-reception history of the Book of Mormon. Johnson examines the way early readers of the Book of Mormon interacted individually with the text, creating paratextual apparatuses like indexes and marginalia that respond both personally and exegetically to the content of the book. These notations are evidence for, a, for the careful reading practices of the book's first readers. And they provide a trove of primary data for understanding its earliest scripturalization because they inhabit the space between reader and text in which the phenomenon of scripture arises. So Johnson's work adds two important insights to the scripturalization thesis. First, private scripturalization behaviors may differ significantly from communal strategies, even as the two overlap. And second, personal exegesis and associated practices are often a central part of scripturalization. Serious private study of the Book of Mormon remains an important practice for contemporary Latter-day Saints, guided by an official manual, as well as the digital proliferation of study aids. This form of private yet communal reading functions as ongoing scripturalization, an incubator for new religious subjectivities organized around expertise, entertainment, and consumption, and as identity formation in a global church. And then finally, excavation, not exegesis. Johnson's work on private scripturalization updates the thesis of Terrell Givens, who famously argued, based on Grant Underwood's, Underwood's foundational research, that the Book of Mormon functioned in its first context primarily as a public sign or performance of Joseph Smith's prophetic calling, while its content remained relatively unimportant for public framings of the book as scripture. As a public speech act, then, the book's illocutionary function was more important than its locutionary meaning. More recently, literary scholars like Elizabeth Fenton, Jared Hickman, and Peter Coviello have trained a genealogical lens on the Book of Mormon, excavating the formations of power, knowledge, and race that were first enlisted to constitute the book as scripture and were then transformed by the collision of scripturalization with secularization. From different corners, each of these scholars finds that the Book of Mormon drew on the cultural prestige of the authorized Bible but cashed out traditional biblical authority as a more modern form of authenticity. Ironically, this innovation, which interacted in contradictory ways with a rising secular epistemology, functioned both to reinforce and to undermine traditional biblicism, creating space for new, although not unproblematic, racial formations. Taken together, the work of these scholars shows how emergent scripture negotiates shifting formations of cultural power and can birth new epistemologies in the process, which in turn can re-racialize bodies and peoples in unexpected ways. To be sure, authority, affiliation, and violence remained unevenly distributed across lines of class, race, gender, and geography. But discursive turbulence in the wake of the Book of Mormon's appearance provisionally redrew those lines. <clears throat> So I think it could be fairly objected um, that this effort so far to synthesize recent Book of Mormon scholarship toward a social process theory of scripture, whatever the strengths of its insight, more directly answers the question, what is scripturalization than what is scripture? Wimbush brings an appropriate skepticism of literacy to the scripturalization thesis, recognizing that any definition of scripture tied to a written text will exclude large swaths of non-Western religion-making from the comparative lens. 
Acknowledging his point, I'd nevertheless argue that when the particular scripturalized object in view happens to be a written text, close exegetical reading is a necessary, though not sufficient, element of social process analysis. And the Book of Mormon offers a good test case in why this is true. To be sure, no responsible scholar would suggest that the book need not be opened at all. Though I am reminded of Thomas O'Day's dry observation that the Book of Mormon has not been universally considered by its critics as one of those books that must be read in order to have an opinion of it. I think it's fair to say that the content of the Book of Mormon has, until perhaps recently, been underappreciated for what it demonstrates about the social process of scripturalization itself. I've already noted that the work of Janice Johnson finds close reading and other exegetical activities to be forms of private scripturalizations. So historians should read the Book of Mormon very carefully because that is what scripturalizers do. Um, and I've also noted with Wimbush that the Book of Mormon is extraordinarily self-reflexive um, about the process of scripturalization that unfolds within its pages, right? So it offers an especially candid account of the sausage making that goes into producing scripture. So just to conclude, I'll look at one particular instance of this theme. So Book of Mormon narrators have a peculiar tendency to refer to their scripture making work with the phrase, these things. Um, and I'll skip some of my, some of my content here. Um, but you'll notice this, if you're, especially if you're reading the last several chapters of the Book of Mormon, this phrase, these things, pops up again and again and again in reference to the work of producing these, um, this scripture. Um, what is implied in that little phrase and what's at stake in thinking of the Book of Mormon as things? Well, if you look in the 1828 Webster's um, Dictionary, the primary sense of the word things is an event. That's what, which comes, falls, or happens. So the Book of Mormon thinks of itself primarily as an event, not as an object. It calls itself things. It's a series of micro events. And I argue that it understands itself as scripture as micro-receptions. It becomes scripture in the moment that it arrives in the hand of, of a reader or a community of readers. It is opened and it's received as scripture. That is how the Book of Mormon conceives of its power as scripture. Um, and the, um, so the primary meaning of this is the contingency of scripturalization, right? This is the source of great anxiety for the writers of the Book of Mormon because they cannot control how the Book of Mormon is received. They can only control how the Book of Mormon is written, and that doesn't matter. That doesn't matter for its scripturalization. What matters is how it is received. How can an imperfect text be made to speak to readers with the power of scripture? So Moroni is given, the final narrator of the Book of Mormon is given to understand that the success or failure of the Book of Mormon as an event is determined by the way it's received. Um, Moroni's, um, let's see. It is this theory of scripture that allows Latter-day Saints to countenance one of its most distinctive teachings, the ever-expanding canon of scripturalized books and practices that gathers up and binds together the religion-making of all peoples of the world. Moroni's reader-centered theory of scripture may also legitimize the common but contested rhetorical move in religious studies by which the divine origins of the book are bracketed, at least for the purpose of understanding the Book of Mormon as scripture. Um, just to conclude, as I noted above, my native academic tongue is literary criticism and theology, not religious studies, and I've been speaking history as a second language here today in hope of facilitating dialogue with my co-panelists and in honor of Wimbush's legacy here at CGU. But theology and religious studies can find common ground in scripturalization theories, attentive, capacious, and complex understanding of scripture as a phenomenon of dialogic, co-constitutive discursive events through which readers act on texts to produce authorizing knowledge and texts act on readers to produce religious subjectivities. Both disciplines look to the illocutionary or performative power of scripture, its capacity to signify in the world beyond the literal meaning of its content to challenge any uncritical appeal to a static, flat, or uncontestable authority of scripture. The terms, processes, and effects of scripture are never static. Though real differences in ultimate horizons remain, we can agree that scripture is only scripture in process and in community. And in community, it is, to quote scripture, living and active. Thank you. Thank you.